If there's one thing that I really enjoy, which should be evident from the content that I produce on the channel, it's that I absolutely love alternative planting methods. I'm absolutely fascinated by it, and for me it's one of the funnest ways to create art, enjoy plants, and bring nature indoors. Excluding setups for my animals, I don't always keep designs that I make due to space and time restrictions. There are a few that immediately pop into my head though, like the Minnie Moss Mountain Dish. There's also the self-watering moss wall and the living brick to name a few. Those and many others were a lot of fun. Another concept that I'd love to showcase on the channel that would fit right in is Wabi Kusa. Now I don't want to bore you with the details, but I should give a brief introduction for those of you unfamiliar with it. Wabi Kusa, in short, is typically a substrate ball which serves as a terrain for emergent aquatic plants. Oftentimes they're kept under glass to facilitate optimal conditions. In this way, we can think of it as a riparian terrarium of sorts. I've discussed riparian plant growth in detail before, but what I'm typically referring to are plants grown in an aquatic setting that are only partially submerged. This works with select terrestrial plants and a vast majority of aquatic plants. We generally think of aquatic plants as just that, but the fact is that most will readily grow out of water if conditions are favorable. Additionally, most commercial aquarium plants are grown in their terrestrial form to expedite the process and for easier transport. This is why a newly planted aquascape oftentimes melts away. In most cases, the plants simply need to adjust to the environmental shift and will eventually return in aquatic form. The same will occur if the scenario is reversed. This is all very intriguing to me because I love to see how the plants look as they grow in different conditions. And if you're already keeping aquariums, I'd highly recommend doing something like a Wabi Kusa just to see what happens. Anyway, how should we go about making a Wabi Kusa ball like this one? At its most basic level, this is just a ball of dirt wrapped up in sphagnum moss. If we take a closer look though, it's a little more than that. The first and primary component I have is aqua soil. It really doesn't matter which, as long as it's a soil based mix like this one. I've seen Wabi Kusa made exclusively with aqua soil, but apparently they're prone to fall apart, which would make sense. To help bind things together, I'll include some cocoa fiber. These alone may be sufficient, but I thought of another, seemingly strange amendment, clay cat litter. Now I don't know if others have used it in this application before, but it should really help bind things together. The reason I even thought to include this was because of some Bavarian builds I did back in the day. I didn't develop the idea, but you can mix clay litter with other components like you'll see in this build to make a pretty decent background. It's not a perfect solution, but it works because the litter is made from bentonite clay. You could simply buy bentonite as bentonite to be more thorough, but this is an easy and cost effective option. Anyway, if you were to use this, just make sure to get one that's made from clay with no additives. If unsure, just look at the back of the package. My thought process behind this, and hear me out, was from the perspective of a meatball. We have the aqua soil, which is the meat, cocoa fiber, which is the breadcrumbs, and cat litter, which is the egg. The combination of the three should make for a stable ball that functions well. I went with three parts aqua soil, one part cat litter, and one part cocoa fiber. I felt it would be easiest to hydrate the components individually and then combine them together. I'm sure you could do it the other way around though. I began with the aqua soil. I combined it with water and kneaded it all together until it became the consistency of dough or clay. I don't know the exact ratio, but I'd recommend starting with a little water and add more as needed. I did the same for the clay. It requires much less water than the aqua soil and will end up being pretty firm. From there I pressed the aqua soil out into a thin layer. I crumbled the clay evenly over it. Then I poured on the cocoa fiber and mixed everything together. It will end up being pretty stable and hold up well when molded together. After all of that, you can make the ball whatever size you want. Something around the size of a fist or smaller is probably ideal though. For this build, I made mine around the size of a fist. You most likely will end up with a little bit of excess. If so, just pop it into a zip bag and save it for future builds. To give the ball more stability and to wick and retain water, I'll wrap it up in sphagnum moss. I rehydrated it prior so that it's easy to work with. I also have some fishing line which I'll use to wrap it up. It's best to use something synthetic for this part like fishing line so that it doesn't decompose. Otherwise the ball would likely fall apart long term. 
Anyway, I put down a bed of moss over top of a piece of line. I placed the ball onto this and began wrapping it up. I pulled it over the ball the best I could and tied the line in the center. I repeated this over and over again to stabilize the moss. After all of that, I tied off the line and removed the excess. You should end up with something that looks a little like this. It's pretty easy to do and doesn't require a lot of materials. Alternatively, you could buy a pre-made Wabi Kusa ball or modeling substrate to speed up the process. You should know I like to do things on this channel though, and I find it a lot more enjoyable to go the DIY route. This is my take on it though, so feel free to experiment with the blend and different things like that to find a mix that works best for you. With that addressed, we can finally move on to the plants. As I said earlier, aquatic plants are what are traditionally used, and it just so happens that I have some immersed growth here that needs trimmed. This tank, for example, has some Hygrophila corombosa that grew right out of the top. You'll notice that it has some flowers on it as well. That's pretty awesome. I also have Alternanthra dentata in this tank. To my knowledge, it isn't an aquatic plant, but it needs trimmed, so why not include some? I trimmed the plants just above the waterline so that more immersed growth will occur in no time. For now, I placed the trimmings in a cup of water so they don't dry out. I went around my tanks and pulled additional plants that I felt would complement the ones I just trimmed. In addition to those, I also have some tissue cultured plants. These will work great for a build like this since they are grown in terrarium like conditions. As such, there will be minimal acclimation die off provided the humidity is kept high enough. We can't create a proper Wabi Kusa without some moss. Now depending on how you decide to keep it, you have some options here. In my case, I'm going to have it fully immersed so I can use whatever moss I want. If I could make a suggestion though, thread moss, fern moss, and badge moss are a few that would work exceptionally well in an environment like this. That said, if you intend to fully submerge your Wabi Kusa, you probably want to stick to aquatic species like Java moss. Some terrestrial mosses will transition to aquatic environments, but it's not always a successful endeavor. Anyway, I kept it simple for mine and went with a mix of flame moss and java moss. I used this to cover the majority of the ball. Something to keep in mind though is that the very bottom of this is going to be pressed up against the container, so you're not going to need moss for that area. It will also spread over time, so if you only have a little bit to work with, just loosely spread it around the top. I have a decent amount for mine though, so it's going to cover the vast majority of it. For good measure, I secured it with more fishing line. In doing so, I used as few wraps as possible. This is a good time to say that you probably want to have a sprayer or bowl of water on hand. That way you can keep the ball hydrated during construction. At this point, we're going to start adding the plants. The whole process will be made much easier though if you have yourself a pair of tweezers. I prefer ones that are pointed like these because they're less intrusive and for me at least, easier to use. As with pretty much any build, I always like to start with the largest elements. So in this instance, that would be the Alternanthra and Hygrophila. I'll plant these near what will be the back side of the piece. To do this is quite simple, especially if you have pointed tweezers. What I did was create pockets with the tweezers that the plants can nestle into. This way the roots won't be excessively smothered by the dense substrate and they will stay upright from the start. Eventually they will grow into the substrate ball, but if I just jammed them into it, it would most likely smother the roots, which wouldn't be optimal. I had to clean the tissue cultured plants off before use. They're grown in a gel that we don't want in the system. It's easily removed by just pulling it off in water. I also gently separated the plants so they're easier to work with. I added these the same way I did the previous plants. As they grow, these crypts will really fill in the foreground. With this in mind, I planted them in a horseshoe shape around the background plants. I think the hydrocaudal is best served as a mid-ground plant as well. From there, I used the echinodorus to transition into the foreground. To finish it off, I filled in various areas with the baby tears. With its fine textures, this really brought everything together and made things look wild. Here's the result after all of that. I don't know about you, but I think it looks pretty cool. It certainly has the vibe and essence of a terrarium or jungle aquascape, but there's a unique life all its own. The cool thing about making these is that it gives you a lot of creative freedom. You can combine several balls together to make a little landscape or even use them to plant an existing tank. 
For example, if you have a hardscaped enclosure, you can make a few of these and situate them in appropriate locations instead of planting directly into a substrate layer. This makes it easy to adjust designs or move things from tank to tank. They can also be used to easily make a riparium or paludarium style setup. Just take advantage of the hardscape elements and situate them right below the water line. I'll show you more about that in future videos, but for now, I need to select a proper container for this, and once again, there's a lot of options to choose from. It will all vary depending on what plants you've chosen and what condition they're in whenever you set up the Wabi Kusa. For example, the tissue culture plants will have the best chance of success if kept in a humid environment. So for this build, it makes sense to use something with a covering that will retain humidity, at least initially, and I can dial it back the longer it's set up. Here are a few examples of things I could use. Jars like a latch top or cork top will work fine, especially if you want the ball in a completely sealed environment. For a more refined look, you could go with a close style container like this one. Another option would be a larger container like this, where you could eventually fill it up with water to submerge the Wabi Kusa. For mine, I've decided to combine two different containers. I took the base from a cloche that just so happened to match up with this piece. I like the combo because it gives the look of a cloche while also having an opening on the top. As such, I can easily adjust the humidity and switch from a sealed to open container with ease. Either way, the main consideration is the dish on the bottom. This could be something as simple as a soup bowl or whatever else you have lying around. The dish will be filled with some water that the sphagnum moss wicks up. As such, it will keep the plants well hydrated at their roots. Keep in mind though that the system needs to be topped off periodically if it's open. You may also need to spray the plants every now and again, especially if they're in an open system. Another layer that you could add to all of this is a little bit of hardscape. Elements like driftwood or stones could be included for additional interest to your little world. For mine, I really don't have much additional space to work with other than the vertical area. So I kept it simple and stuck a few pieces of spiderwood into the ball. I also included a very thin layer of sand on the bottom. There you have it, my take on a Wabi Kusa design. I think it's an awesome way to explore creativity in this realm and bring nature indoors. In my opinion, it's closer to a terrarium than anything else, but making one is much different. If you enjoy plants and like making art, I definitely recommend giving it a try. They're not very difficult to make and require minimal upkeep, especially in an enclosed system. Not only that, but the imperfect jungle that will eventually take shape is what it's all about. These are not intended to be immaculately scaped and designed enclosures. They should in some ways reflect the ephemeral, chaotic nature of life itself, which is interesting if you really think about it. If you're still on the fence about bringing nature indoors but are seriously considering it, this might be a good place to start. With that, keep in mind that you can use terrestrial plants as well, which may be easier for you to obtain. If not, maybe a more traditional closed terrarium is the way to go. I don't care either way, all that I can say is that there's so much joy to be had in this sort of art form. I could go on and on about this stuff for hours, but I think that's a good place to end it. As always, I really hope you all enjoyed the video and learned something new. Let me know what you think about it down in the comments, and until next time, Serpa Squad, take care and peace.